Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'll meet you there in a moment. Um, If you were to pay a visit to my kitchen, you would uh, notice, you know, I have all the normal utensils, dishes, cups, gizmos, and gadgets, right, uh, that you might be used to. But um, I was struck this week as... um, I was unloading the dishwasher, you know, husband points, right? I was unloading the dishwasher for my wife. And I noticed that there's so many things that I see every day, right? There's things that I always load into the dishwasher. There's things I unload. So they get regularly used. But there's things in my, like, I still have cabinets full of things that I hardly ever see, right? And um, I was even looking around our kitchen and your kitchen is laid out in a way that says you're probably going to need some space for things that you don't use that often. Like, does anybody else have like the little cabinets above their fridge? And I'm talking about like who is getting into that every day? Nobody. Nobody's getting that cabinet is designed so that when you open it, you say, oh, yeah, we have one of those. Right. That's what it is for that cabinet. And it's set up in a way that you're constantly reminded of the things that you do use all the time. You, you got things easily accessible, right? And so if you were to ask me, you know, hey, Brent, give me a spoon. I could find a spoon starting from like the second floor bedroom in the pitch black. Not only any spoon, I could find the medium-sized spoon with the right handle that's perfect for ice cream every time, blindfolded. I could get it. Why? I use that spoon a lot, right? I know where it is. I know where it's at in the drawer, right? But there's things in my kitchen that I don't even remember are there. The thing I pull out every so often, I'm like, oh yeah, we have one of these. What I want to talk about this morning is a spiritual discipline that is fairly safe for me to say that most of us treat like that as seen on TV microwave omelet maker that's sitting in a cabinet somewhere, right? You pull it out every now and then and you're reminded of, I don't really like this. And so you put it back in the cabinet and we don't use it that often. I'm referring to the discipline of fasting. Read with me in Matthew 6, look at verse 16, where Jesus says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now these words are in the middle of what is famously recorded as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? This is the manifesto of disciples of Jesus, Matthew 5 through 7. It's contrasting the hypocrisy of the religious people in that day and age with the God's desired characteristics for a true Christian. And it should be noted that in chapter 6, there are three assumptions that Jesus makes of every one of his disciples. He's not installing something new. He is not uh, giving them a new command. Rather, he is clarifying and instructing on things already established, which Again, it's congruent with Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus says, do not think that I come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The three assumptions Jesus makes of his disciples is that they will give to the needy, pray, and fast. Matthew 6, verses 2 and 3, he repeats twice, when you give to the needy, In verses 5, 6, and 7, he says, when you pray, and here in verses 16 and again in 17, when you fast. And so as I look at my life, I have a context for giving to the needy. I'm not perfect at it, but that makes sense to me. Yes, we should help those in need. I want to be a charitable person. I have a context for prayer. I believe firmly in the power of prayer. I need to pray more. But I do not have a good framework in my life for fasting. It doesn't really compute with my life. But here's Jesus talking about it in a way that assumes it's a regular part of my life. Not if you choose to fast or if you feel spiritual enough to fast, but when you fast. 
So if you're like me and you don't have this completely figured out, I want to invite you into the process with me this morning. I'm not an expert. I am very much a student. I want to share some things that does not put me in the platform of a master or teacher on the subject, but rather things that have given me a framework for how to put this in my life, even starting to implement it this past week. And my hope is that I would be able to read when you fast and know that my spiritual walk fits into that category in a way that honors Jesus. So the first step is to understand what we mean when we're talking about fasting. Because it's interesting, as I say that word, there are so many different connotations that fit throughout the room, dependent on your social, cultural, or religious background. Maybe you grew up in church that practiced fasting as a whole church. Maybe your family implemented this as a rhythm of your life. Maybe your heritage comes from a place where people fasted. All of that can be true. Let me share with you my context for understanding fasting. I grew up in the church, and I'm sure in some Sunday school lesson or sermon or teaching throughout my childhood into middle school, high school, people use the word fasting, but I don't recall any of them. The only context I had for fasting was something as a middle schooler when I signed up for an event my church hosted called 30-Hour Famine. Anybody else do 30-Hour Famine? Talking about? Okay, let me explain it to you. A few of us in the room know what this is like. This was awesome. Okay. Third Hour Famine was put on by an organization called World Vision, and your youth group would host an event all on kind of around the same weekend, and for 30 hours, you would not eat as a group, right? And but leading up to the event, you would raise money, kind of like when people run marathons and like, hey, will you sponsor me? I'm going to run this many miles. Would you pay me this much? We're saying, hey, would you pay me to not eat? And so we'd raise money. And so we'd walk into this weekend and all of it, like, again, like, let me just say, like, broad stroke, in, in theory, this is a great practice. To, the goal was to get a bunch of, like, white suburban kids to understand what it's like to miss a meal, right? And to, like, help them relate to world hunger. And it was a great thing. In the heart of sinful eighth grade Brent, not a great reality, just being honest, um, because the event was the draw. It was awesome. They hosted it at this like awesome venue, and they had activities all night. We played. They, you know, it was like lock-in style, so dodgeball and worship and activities and things like that. And they just stocked the fridges full of Mountain Dew and Capri Sun and Sunny D because that's not food; that was liquid. And so we'd just be pounding these liquids all night. And it, again, like okay, don't judge me. Like so, about two, three a.m. Right, lock-in style. Nobody's sleeping. We get really hungry, and so we decided that we, you know, try to figure this out and we can't, we had a revelation. If you take Swiss Miss hot chocolate packets, put it in a cup, put a little bit of cold water in there, you can make pudding. And so at like 2 a.m., there's just a bunch of middle school boys pounding pudding in a cup, like to survive the 30-hour famine because we didn't know if we could make it to the 7 a.m. pancake breakfast. Like we didn't know it was gonna happen. This is my whole context for fasting in my life, right? Just being real with you. Now, I have to say, World Vision does not condone the actions of my eighth grade <laughs> youth group. I'm sure there were other youth groups that were led through a very strict thing that it was really impactful for them. But in my deceitful uh, heart, it was not that great for me. And again, like, I didn't see a reason to think about it differently for most of my life. My church... Uh, communities that I grew up in. This wasn't a common practice for us. This wasn't something that was talked about a lot. So that never really changed my framework. But as I got older and I started to interact with more and more men and women of faith who loved Jesus, who were close to Jesus, I started to hear about the idea of fasting being a regular practice for them. And so I started to question and ask, Lord, how, how am I thinking about this in the wrong way, how do I need to think about it? What is biblical fasting? Well, let's start with what it's not. It's not abstinence. You regularly hear people say things like, hey, I'm fasting from social media, or I'm not gonna spend money this month, I'm gonna take a fast from shopping, and that's great things to do, but that, that is not fasting, that is abstinence which has a long and rich history in the church is helpful in your walk with Jesus. It's also not a restricted diet. Kind of the, the biggest trend that has come from a biblical view of fasting is the Daniel fast, right? Which is eating a vegan diet, but in the Daniel story, the word fast is never used. 
Daniel is not fasting, rather he is on a restricted diet, which also has a long and rich history in the church and can be helpful in your walk with Jesus. Fasting, at its most basic, is not eating food. In a normal fast, you continue to drink water, but there's also cases in scripture of a fast from both food and water. And fasting is most commonly associated with spiritual motivation. But in recent years, the scientific world has taken notice and started to promote fasting due to long-term research showcasing various health benefits. Intermittent fasting has gone viral as a way to kickstart weight loss or just help you choose uh, better habits for your life. But we must understand that fasting as disciples of Jesus cannot be strictly a physical discipline that we hope leads to a spiritual benefit. That is a diet with a side of Jesus. That is not our motivation. Because I believe we are prone to view life from a dualism perspective. We separate everything that happens in our physical life and everything that happens in our spiritual life. We view things such as reading our Bible, prayer, even worship as as things that build us spiritually but have no interaction and don't matter what happens physically. But that is a disservice and contrary to the way God has created you. We are holistic beings. And while it is not the physical act of your eyes letting in light to see words on a page and your mind comprehending that those letters form words which form sentences so that you can read it and then be able to ruminate and interpret it and decide how it's going to apply to your life, that is not the thing that changes you. Rather, the Holy Spirit that illuminates it within your inner being, your soul that allows you to connect with who God is and be revealed, and you're tapped into a spiritual side of yourself, that that changes you. Both are true. Both must happen. And you can pray in your heart as you drive to work, but have you ever prayed prostrate on the floor, letting your tears hit the rug as you weep and lament over a certain situation or something you are longing for God to do? That prayer is a little bit different because you're physically involved. Fasting is no different. It is a physical response to what God is doing spiritually in or around us. A couple definitions I read this week that were helpful to me to rework this framework of fasting. Scott McKnight says that fasting is the natural, inevitable response of a person to a grievous, sacred moment in life. David Kakish says fasting is a situationally birthed, psychosomatically sensed prompt from the soul to seek direction, correction, or comfort from God through prayer-soaked abstention as we await the return of our king. So let that help you with your understanding of a definition, but what about motivation? Why should we fast? How should we fast? Now it's important to note that fasting is not a command. Nowhere in scripture will you say, thus says the Lord, you shall fast. You don't have to fast, but Jesus fasted. And as followers of Jesus, our desire should be to be more like Jesus and to be close to him in this life. So if fasting is something that will draw us closer to Jesus and to imitate the way he lived, why wouldn't he? Right? It's kind of like when you look up directions on your phone. Right? You type in an address and your phone might suggest three different routes. But it highlights one because it's assuming you want to get there as quickly and easily as possible. And so you can drive any way you want. You can go all sorts of different directions. But if you know that there's a direct route to get there, why would you not take advantage of that? Fasting can be like that. Jesus is assuming his disciples are fasting because it is something that will help them overcome the sinful nature of everything in this life. It is a tool available to them the same way prayer and Bible reading and these other disciplines are so that we could be closer connected to the heart of God. So why would we not take advantage of fasting? But we need to use it correctly as a tool or it loses its power. It starts to become something not what it's meant to be. So let's take a look at why we fast. Simply this, we fast physically as a way to worship spiritually. 
In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes these words. He says, I I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Note Paul's word choice, present your bodies, not just your heart. The word in Greek is soma, where we get the word somatic. It means your whole person, including your physical body. A lot of times you might hear Christians, pastors, I know that I've said it, is you need to let Jesus into your heart. You need to give your heart to God. That's beautiful language, but to be clear, God doesn't just want your heart. He wants all of you, every part of you. Part of the reason we emphasize the heart over the whole person is because in the Western church overall, we have lost what is known as the theology of the body, which put simply is the truth that all through scripture, you don't have a body, you are a body. Your body is a part of who you are. Jesus came in a body, a doctrine we call the incarnation, to save all of our body, the doctrine we call the resurrection. One day in the future, at Jesus' return, what happened to Jesus' body will happen to our bodies and all his followers will be raised from death to life. In the meantime, then, our discipleship must take the body seriously. Paul also famously said to the Corinthians, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your body is a temple. It's a dwelling place for God. Therefore, what you do with the body matters. And the body is the place where our discipleship to Jesus becomes real. Where it's no longer just about an idea or even a feeling but it's put into practice. One way to think about discipleship is as a disciplined attempt to get the teachings of Jesus into your body itself. Think neurobiology, muscle memory, so that when you're confronted with various situations, his teachings just come out of you without you even thinking about it. Another fascinating thing in our day and age is this concept of habit building and how we realize that we carve these neural pathways in our brains to where we just do things without even thinking about it. Things like brushing your teeth or getting dressed or things that don't take a lot of choices in your brain and because your brain has carved a neural pathway for it. That is what we are trying to do with these disciplines to follow Jesus so that when we're confronted with opportunities to sin or things that where we don't know what to do or, or ways to, that we could honor God or honor our flesh, we automatically go towards the things that would honor God. God has designed our bodies in a way to help with that. Fasting is one of the best possible ways to get the teachings of Jesus into your body. And back to Romans 12, we present our bodies to Jesus by the mercies of God. Meaning we do this for him because of all he's done for us. We give up food because he gave up everything. We offer our bodies in devotion because he gave his body for our salvation. We fast for all sorts of reasons, but this has to be the primary reason we fast. Not to get something from Jesus, but to give something to him. What Paul calls worship. Our love, our devotion, our affection, our motivation for physical fasting must be spiritual worship. And so if we have that right, then we start to look at the how. What does this look like in the life of a disciple of Jesus? I heard a pastor this week describe fasting as both a rhythm and a response. In scripture and in church history, we see those two different types of fasting played out, rhythm and response. So rhythm first, this would be fasting twice a week for most of church history. You see followers of Jesus designating a rhythmic type of fasting. In the Old Testament, there's a a rhythm to God commanding his people to fast on Yom Kippur. And that was a rhythm in their life. 
And then in a response, most of the examples of fasting in scripture are a response to something like a national crisis, like an invasion, or sin, or grief and loss. In 1 Samuel 31, King Saul dies, the entire nation fasts for seven days. In Jonah 3, Nineveh is warned of their coming destruction, so the king calls for a citywide fast, and they are spared. And in Esther 4, when the Hebrew people are threatened with genocide, Queen Esther calls for a three-day fast, and they are saved. Rhythm and response. And as a rhythm, we can look at it this way, that we fast regularly to grow spiritually. We fast regularly as a way to grow spiritually. Again, Jesus is saying, when you fast, he's assuming, because he's speaking to a culture where fasting was a regular part of their life. All throughout church history, practicing Christians would fast twice a week. A lot of times the Pharisees were were fasting on these two days, and later on, church leaders changed it to Wednesdays and Fridays they would fast, because Wednesday was the day that Jesus was betrayed, and Friday was the day Jesus was crucified. Commonly, they would fast upon waking until sundown. Once the sun went down, they would enjoy a simple meal in gratitude. And it was a rhythmic reminder that their dependence on the Lord was greater than their need for food, that the longing that they felt physically for food was not as great as their longing to be with Jesus. And this is such a foreign concept in our culture today because everything we seek and desire is a motivation from comfort, right? You look at the forecast coming and as it creeps towards the 90s, no one's intentionally walking over to the thermostat and switching off the air conditioning because you want to be comfortable. Everything that has been marketed to our society is so that you would be more comfortable. The food industry at large has convinced us that we need to eat at least three meals a day. And they even named one of those meals to reiterate that you've gone too long without eating as you slept. Get up, break fast. It's, it's, it's been at least eight hours. Eat some eggs and pancakes and bacon and hash browns. Just get out, get all in, right? Nothing in our society, especially since the Industrial Revolution, has been geared to help you create a spiritual framework of abstaining or withholding or intentionally feeling discomfort for the sake of personal and spiritual growth. Everything is geared towards your comfort. What's fascinating to me is right now we're seeing in our culture a trend towards the scientific physical side of things, right? Again, intermittent fasting is, is, has blown up. It's like, oh, this has a lot of health benefits. Things like cold plunging or high intensity exercise, Spartan races, tough mutters, like you're paying someone to create an environment where you are uncomfortable because they're starting to realize your body actually needs to be stretched, needs to uh, feel some want. Otherwise, you just start to waste. Your muscles deteriorate. We need to be in uncomfortable environments. And the scientific world is catching hold of this. And I believe this is eternity marked on humankind. That even if all of our physical needs are met, we cannot fill ourselves spiritually. The physical is still yearning to know that we are dependent upon the Lord. Creation groans under the weight of sin. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything we could need. And so when we intentionally put ourselves in an environment where we are longing for something, it reminds us of our need for him. And a couple things will change if you start to implement a rhythmic fasting in your life. One, your prayer life will change. See, you can fast without praying, right? You can treat it as I'm just doing this for health, Uh, It's just healthy for me to fast, and it has no spiritual motivation. You can also pray without fasting. Those are both true. But combining the two is an incredibly powerful tool used all throughout church history. In Scripture, in Acts 13, the disciples are fasting and praying 
so that God will hear their prayers, but also so that they can hear from God. They, they need clear direction on what to do next, and so they're fasting and praying. If your prayer life feels stale, if God feels distant, if you think God is mute, he's not speaking, incorporate a day of fasting into your prayer. Now, it's not a silver bullet. It's not magic. You might just pray hangry prayers for a day, and that's okay. But as it becomes a rhythm, you will start to see that if your prayer is simply, oh God, I need you more than this food, your dependence on the Lord will increase and your prayer life will increase and you will start to see God speak clearly and move clearly in your life as you depend upon him. Secondly, your desires will change. Some of this is just simple that as you deny your appetite for food, your appetite for sin will also decrease. The simple act of self-control over food shows you the possibility to gain control over sinful desires. Now hear me, I'm not saying willpower alone is the way you defeat sin, right? We are already prone to that enough as, as followers of Christ. I'll just pull myself up by the bootstraps, I'll beat this sin, or I just won't talk about it, I'll tuck it away. We need to deal with sin in the right way, but fasting allows us to put ourselves in a place where we say, I am so dependent upon the Holy Spirit's power in my life to overcome this, that I can also see him working that same power in my life over this sin. That the hold this sin over ha has over me, that I keep running back to, I keep doing the same things over again. Paul saying in Romans 7, oh, wicked flesh that I am, wretched man that I am. I keep doing the things that I don't want to do. Fasting is a way for you to break the hold that that has over you, to wake up your body to say, I, you are not in control anymore, flesh. I am under the Spirit's power in my life. I have freedom and authority. I am walking in resurrection power now. Fasting aligns you and gives you access to that power, reminds you of whose you are in Christ. So if you're struggling with repetitive sin or you can't seem to break free from sinful desires, I would encourage you, incorporate regular rhythmic fasting into your walk with Jesus. Take that time that you would normally be eating and pray for God to give you victory in your life. Fasting as a rhythm is a helpful thing, but we also see fasting as a response. And as a response, we fast extendedly as a way to prepare spiritually. As far as what makes a fast extended, there's no set time given in scripture. It's not like if you fast more than 24 hours, it's now an extended fast. There's nothing like that. We can see the most common fast for people is the waking till sundown. But there are examples in scripture of two-day fast, three-day fast, seven-day, 21-day, and 40-day fast. Now, if you're considering, hey, I wanna start the practice of fasting and you're anything like my personality, you might be thinking, 40-day fast, that sounds like the way to just jumpstart this thing. Let's just get it done, let's just all or nothing. Let me just caveat real quick. There's only three recorded 40-day fasts in the Bible completed by Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Okay, and I don't know if this correlates, but all I'm saying is on the mount, when Jesus, transfiguration, Jesus meets with Moses and Elijah. No one else says, I think they were having a 40-day fast meeting, like handing out their swag, like they got a shirt that said, I did the 40-day fast. No one else was invited to that. So I'm just saying, if, you, if you're like, I'm going to do 40, just be careful. Be, be sure that the Lord has called you to that before you undertake it. It's kind of a big, big thing. Something else to note about extended fast in the Bible they are a response to align with what God is already doing, not a stubborn refusal of food until God does what you want. As a parent of young children, there have been plenty of times where I put something out on the table and my kid's response is, I'm not eating that. I'm not, you're going to watch me suffer in hunger. You're my parent. You're supposed to take care of me. I'm not eating anything until you make me what I want. I want a dino chicken nuggets and you didn't, not, I didn't eat spinach, right? That is not what we're doing as, as followers of Jesus when we fast. It's not like, Lord, I'm not eating anything until you change your mind or do something different. Give me what I want. That is not the heart of fasting. The heart of fasting is that, again, we are entering into a state of dependence and aligning ourselves under God's will, asking, believing, petitioning the Lord to move on our behalf. 
Recognizing God's sovereignty and admitting ourselves to ourselves that in whatever situation we find to be in, we are fully dependent on the Lord. And the fast is just a holistic way of saying, I am under God's sovereignty. And there's a story of this in 2 Samuel 12 after David is rebuked of his sin with Bathsheba. We see the consequences of a sinful act in a sinful, broken world played out as the child conceived from David's sin becomes sick. And it says in 2 Samuel 12 that David therefore sought God on behalf of the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And he does this for seven days and the child ends up dying still. And his advisors were worried. They're like, oh man, he was pretty wrecked when he found out the child was sick. What's, what's gonna happen now? Like he might hurt himself. Like, I don't know if he finds out the child died. And, and David overhears him and he's like, Is the child, has the child died? And they say, yes, he's, the child died. And David gets up, takes a shower, gets dressed, goes to church, worships, comes home, eats a meal. And they were kind of complexed by this. They're like, that that doesn't make sense. Like we thought you would like fast and weep more once the child died. And David responds by saying this, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. David was not using fasting as a way to like trick God into somehow doing something for him. And God wasn't holding it over David's head like a carrot saying, oh, if you just fast enough, then I'll feel better. No, that wasn't it. God's will was being played out. His ways are higher than David's ways. So here's David submitting himself to trust in the Lord more than food to show God that he was serious about repentance from his sin and that he was willing to submit himself that whatever God would do was what God needed to do. And fasting allowed him to enter into that. And then once the decision was made by the Lord, he rose and he worshiped. Not my will, but yours be done. Something I've been convicted of lately is missing the opportunity to implement something like a fast when I face a big decision. There's so many of these instances in our lives where we face a decision that we, we could go a couple different ways or both seem like good ways. I don't really know what to do in this situation. And as a believer in Christ, I know, hey, I should pray. Okay, I'm going to pray and then I should get wise counsel. So I'm going to talk to people that are older than me, maybe been through a similar situation and get some advice. And then I'm just going to use discernment. And, you know, God has given me a spirit of wisdom. And so I'm going to just trust that the decision I make is the right decision, but I have rarely, if ever, said, you know what? I'm going to fast and ask for the Lord to be clear. I'm going to show God I'm so dependent on his will for my life that I need his direction more than I need food. As a church, are we prepared to spiritually petition the Lord when we face big things? Good and bad. Are we willing as a church to say, we're gonna pray and fast for God to move in certain situations? We have missionaries in a hard place in the world right now who are being forced to leave and the few remaining disciples that are there are about to start the first Christian church in that city as a church. Would we be willing to fast and pray for those believers? Asking that God would do great things Would we be prepared to fast as a church for the direction and leadership of our church? For the Lord to continue to root out sin and build healthy relationships and show us the way forward? Are we prepared spiritually as a church as we get ready to wrap up our Ephesians series as we look at the armor of God? We're gonna ask our church to be built strong in the Lord, to put on the whole armor of God. And I do not think that the enemy, who scripture says is prowling around like a lion seeking someone to devour, is gonna look at believers who say, yeah, we're gonna be strong in the Lord and we're gonna put on his armor. And Satan's not gonna say, let's test the armor. 
Church, are we prepared spiritually for what the Lord wants to do in and through us, or are we just kind of coasting through, dependent on our own strength, our own ability? Are we in a place of desperation? I can see a day coming where your elders call us to fast to help us prepare spiritually as the attacks continue to come, as the work of God is not yet done until the day we see Jesus, we will fight, we will push back darkness, but we need to be prepared spiritually. Fasting can be a way to tune in to what God wants to do in and through us. So we start to put this all together. Rhythm, response, motivation, definitions. And I want to leave with a few practical applications this morning. I don't want us to just look at this all in theory, but what are some simple things, practical applications you can put into your life even this week? If you want to begin moving fasting from the, that back corner cupboard up into a drawer that you can pull out and use, here's a few things. Number one, start small. Start small. If you've never skipped a meal before, don't start fasting for a week at a time. Don't even start by going a whole day. Give up one meal. Maybe it's lunch. Maybe it's dinner. One day this week, say, uh, instead of eating lunch, instead of eating dinner, I'm going to dedicate my time to intentional prayer. The time that you would normally shop for the food or prep the food, cook the food, eat the food, clean up after the food, all of that time, give it to the Lord. Praying something as simple as, Lord, I need you more than I need this meal. Please help me to grow and be prepared spiritually for whatever you have for me. And then spend some time listening because prayer is not just talking to God, it is listening from God. Start small. The last thing you wanna do is to jump into the deep end of fasting, hate every second of it, and then never do it again. That's not how disciplines are built in our life. That is not Jesus' intention for you when it comes to the discipline of fasting. It is that it would be something that draws you closer to Jesus, not drives you from him. So start small. Number two, stretch yourself, but be smart. This is what I mean. This should not be easy, right? Right? Again, if you're like a person who's like, I never eat breakfast, so I'm just going to start calling that fasting. That's not fasting, right? That's, that's just a part of your life right now. You should know that you're fasting. But you also know yourself better than anyone. So if you have a history where you've struggled with eating disorders or you have health concerns as it relates to food, please consult the doctor, talk to a health professional before you would say, hey, I'm just gonna start skipping meals. Like stretch yourself, but don't do it in a way that would harm you. Know your limits, but fasting is not a comfortable discipline. That feeling of want, that hunger within you should drive you to prayer. It is the motivation to get on your knees before the Lord and say, I need you more than I need this meal. Stretch yourself, but be smart. Number three, remember this is not a competition. This is not a competition. I wanna look back at our passage in Matthew 6 where Jesus says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. There are no awards in this life for fasting. There's no trophies getting handed out at church or in your community. You don't achieve some higher level of salvation if you fast. There are both spiritual and physical benefits that come from it, but that is not our main motivation. And your main motivation cannot be that others would see you and think of you more holy or a better Christian than other people because you fast. Jesus is very clear here that if you're looking for the praise of man and you're fasting, that's the end of all the benefits you will get. It's not a competition. Don't look at other people and their journey and compare it to your own. You can let 
you know, stories of people fasting, you know, reading of, of saints who've gone before us who were dedicated in their rhythm and response of fasting. And you can let that inspire and encourage you, but you don't look at it as that's the standard. You in your relationship with God, you know your own heart. God knows your heart of your motivation for fasting. It should always be in proximity to Jesus. Jesus fasted. We follow Jesus. This is a way to follow Jesus, period. Number four, lean into the journey. There will be good days and bad days. Some days you'll feel like you're so clear-headed, motivated, you couldn't care less about food, your prayer journal is overflowing from all the time you spent fasting, and then other days you'll feel like every food that's tasted good in the entire universe just passed under your nose, and you had to say no because you're fasting, and now you're mad that you're fasting, and no spiritual benefit felt like it was happening. There will be both of those days. That's okay, this is not formulaic. It's organic, it's spiritual, it's tapping into a part of us that is present, but it is blocked and stained by the sinful self. Be reflective, capture your thoughts on your journey, reflect on what God is doing in your life when you fast and see the journey for what it is. For my own life, right? I'm gonna do what Matthew 6 says not to do, right? I'm gonna tell you about my fasting, right? So this week, I'm like, I'm preaching on fasting and as I'm digging into it, I'm convicted. I don't have a rhythm of fasting in my life. So I said, okay, Wednesdays and Fridays, I'm gonna start fasting. Just, you know, again, I did not start small. We're just going two days a week immediately. And so Wednesday comes around and uh, I'm into the day and I'm, I'm feeling good. This feels great. And I'm getting through and it was a very busy day. So it was kind of easy not to think about food throughout the day. And at the end of the night, the sun goes down. And I'm like, okay, I'll go home and enjoy a simple meal. And okay, day one of fasting. And then two revelations come to me. One, I had had a bowl of oatmeal that my kids had kind of left behind that morning. So I'd already like messed up my fasting and I totally forgot about it. And I'm like, that's why I feel great because I actually ate something this morning. And then it was senior night for our students and Miss Leslianic makes amazing cupcakes and there was like a hundred left over and I took a box home and I said, okay, I could have a simple meal or I could have three cupcakes. And I chose three cupcakes. And so then I'm just like going to bed, just like, Lord, I feel so defeated in my ability to, fa- like I, I, I'm preaching on that. I'm like preparing my heart and my soul to like pour it out for my church and I can't even discipline myself enough to do it. But I had some great conversations with the Lord about that. And I learned something about what I want in my life more than I want food. I want the presence of Jesus. And then I, I decide Friday I'm gonna fast and you know, life happened, some things and ended up being, okay, this isn't a good day to do this. There's some meals we're having people, okay, Saturday, Saturday is gonna be the day to fast and you know, set out and I'm like, okay, we're gonna do it. And, we have flag football on Saturdays and I take Mason to that and we're driving home and we drive past Don Shepe taco stand and I'm like, okay, I'll just pick up tacos for lunch. That's a great idea, it's Saturday and I'm sitting there and eating a taco and I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be fasting, <laughs> right? And I'm like, how did I get that like oblivious to what I'm doing? Like, this is the journey. This is the world we live in. Like the distractions, church, the distractions are just so constant that you have to be diligent in every discipline or the world will just take over. And the world is not saying, hey, lean into the presence of Jesus. Let's just give you all this time and place. There is every second will get filled. Every possible scenario will get filled with your flesh if we are not vigilant and disciplined. So I'm in this journey. And the reward Jesus talks about that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What is this reward? Is it it the physical benefits? Is it the feeling of elation that comes as your body cleanses the toxins? Or what is this reward? I am convinced that we need to seek the reward from the Father, which is simply the presence of the Father. It is being in communion with Jesus and recognizing that nothing this world has to offer compares to who Jesus Christ is. And that everything I could ever need, everything I could ever want, this world is is fading away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And the presence of Jesus is everything. So fasting, let it be something that 
lest we spend more time in his presence, more time without distractions, more set aside time, designated time where I'm pursuing a real relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who says, declares in Jeremiah chapter 29, he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let's give all of ourselves to the Lord. Let fasting be a way that you continue to give all of yourself to Jesus so we can be more like him and know him more fully. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word that gives us glimpses into the eternal. Jesus, thank you for your example. Even as you began your ministry to set yourself aside to fast and be dependent upon your Father, showing us that this flesh is constantly fighting against the spiritual because of the brokenness of this world. But Lord, through, through salvation, we have authority and victory over the physical life. And we declare that we need you. And Lord, if that means you need to, to take things out of our life, so be it. Lord, if that means we need to surrender certain times and meals to you so that we could know you more fully, so be it. Lord, if more of you means less of us, then please take everything because we need you. So we offer ourselves to you, our bodies, as a living sacrifice for this is our spiritual worship. And it's all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond in song.